and we are live hello everyone welcome i am liz hancock or elizabeth mary hancock is my proper business name and i'm here with the wonderful susie miller welcome susie hello hello good to see you all yeah i'm <laughs> so excited about um oh we've got a view already how fabulous i'm so excited about um about this webinar and this this chat we're having basically um excuse my very attractive headphones i feel a bit like a pilot um but we have extended this um ways you can listen to this so i'm also um doing it on a good old phone um so that anyone wanting to listen to this by tele seminar link um can do so so if you're not on facebook or if you're not you know you don't want to be on facebook for any reason you can still access this but you do need to have signed up for it so um for future um future notifications you can just email me liz at elizabeth mary hancock let me know you're interested or you can join susie's um susie's group on facebook or, or the facebook page you can like the facebook page like the um join the the groups that we have and um and get access to this wonderful content that we deliver so we do these every month um susie and i collaborate together because I love um, helping people that are doing amazing things, and um, Susie is. So I wanted to um, to work with her, and I love working with her. So Susie, tell us a bit more about what you do and your marketing support group. My the insp inspiration for the marketing support group was because a lot of my uh, clients and the small businesses and medium sized businesses I support are mediators, lawyers, financial um, coaching, counselling, and they're all very talented at what they do, but not necessarily that savvy on marketing because they didn't get that included in their training, which is why they need people like uh, you and me. So. Yeah, so to create that group, and it's brilliant to be able to collaborate with you because of your um, that is your speciality and to be able to work together and help, just help them grow their practices, grow their businesses in ways that really work for them. So it's not all just theory. We can share stories and information and hopefully inspire them to stretch the limits of what they do a little bit more and, uh, yeah, and become more, help more people because that's really what marketing is about, how to create more, do more of your services to a wider audience and help more people. Absolutely. And um, yeah, and that is why I love working with you. Um, and that's so simple, isn't it? Like marketing is about helping you or helping whoever you're helping to reach more people. And um, and it is also like that's that's the great side of marketing. That's why we all do it. But actually, there's a there's a real um, sort of business related reason as well. And that is to make an income mm -hmm. to make profit. Because if we do if we're not making an income if we're not creating an income if we're not making any profit how are we actually going to live and if we're not living then how are we going to serve more people it's 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 a um impossibility isn't it so this webinar um training call podcast whatever you like to call it because it will be out on multiple um multiple platforms higher prices higher profits why pricing yourself high will turn customers on and not off um because that's what it will do um, so we're going to be going through the reasons why, um, what you need to get set in your head and, and your heart, really. You need to feel completely aligned with putting your prices up to in order to increase your profits. You need to feel OK with that. Um, but also some more practical ways of how we can actually do that and make sure that we still um, reach the people that genuinely can't afford our, our services, not just those that, um, that we think are, you know, have got pots of money but often people don't have to have pots of money to invest in the right things at the right at uh, the right um level so um can we, can, we deal, can we deal with the elephant in the room which yeah. is the the fundamental belief that lots of people listening to this or watching this will have which is but if we if I put my prices up, I will lose customers. Yes. So I think it's we might. Is it okay if we start with that? Because I've certainly got some ex examples, and I'm sure you've got many. Yeah. Now, um, if you, I I do agree. There is a limit. So um, if you put them up way too high, you're probably going to have to completely change the type of people that you're marketing to. Um, but most of my clients when they come to me i double their their prices and i do that immediately i might not do it you know they might work up to it in small steps 
um, or, or pretty large steps usually. Say like someone today I was coaching literally this morning, a daily rate is 1500 quid. I said, well, it's now 2000. Fab. Um, and she actually said, this like 50k formula is no joke, is it? Um, <laughs> and you know, 500 quid a day extra, that's brilliant. Um, and, and if she freaked out, we might do that by like 1750 a day or 1800 a day and then 2000. Um, so, so pretty large increments, but absolutely people are going to, so let's take her as an advantage, as a, as an, as an example, if someone, if someone wants a quality consultant, which is what she is, two grand a day, as opposed to 1500, the, the type of client she's going to is probably not going to quibble about 500 quid. Mm -hmm. um, but they are going to see her as much better, higher quality at two thousand pounds a day than fifteen hundred. Now, some of you might be thinking, "Gosh, I wish I could charge that a day." But actually, for the people, especially in your group, Susie, um, the mediators, the lawyers, and so on, um, it, it, you know, we're not talking small fry and small level of service that you're providing. You know, it's it's a high level, it's a service, value added service, and actually, people are going to be turned off if your prices are too low. They're going to yeah, think yeah. you're not very good. They might think you're newly qualified, so you haven't got much experience. They might just say, "Why is she so cheap?" You know, I've um, we're doing our house at the moment, and I met this amazing guy at a house builders conference who designs and builds bespoke wooden kitchens and they're beautiful and I just couldn't get my head around it and I end up I did say to him you should become a client actually because I could double your prices um why are you so cheap and he said well I could charge more if you want me to charge you more um and I said well actually I almost do because I'm I've got a question mark over you because you're so cheap like what's the catch He's, what, what the material and there wasn't any he just he said I just love what I do and I love wood and I don't need I'm not interested in making lots of money and um, so I can understand and I really appreciate where he's coming from but it raised those questions in me and if I wasn't so forward thinking uh, so sort of not afraid to say these things that I did say to him and and wasn't into all the psychology behind it if I was just a, a like most ordinary people are I would probably just have thought too cheap, not quite right. I'm off to Neptune, and then at least double the amount of um, of money. But and because another, another I thing. asked these questions, I was um, I was reassured. But most people wouldn't do that. And um, most people aren't like me. They're not as quite as crazy as me. So yeah, Susie, does that start to answer that question? Yes, and and I think also it's key to uh, isn't it that it's it, you mentioned lawyers. So it's not about just whack popping your prices up is it's defining clearly what your service is because if people understand the value so if you're going to charge a load of money as a lawyer and someone's thinking that you're going to do the whole their whole divorce from from a to in beginning to end and it's going to cost you hours and hours of money that that's not going to work so well but if you can define these this is what i bring that i and this is this is a service a specific service i offer um yeah i'm not a divorce concierge i'm a divorce lawyer and i'm going to give you this and this and you need these things and these are going to save you money and time and hassle in the future by creating these proper legal agreements now that's a completely different thing and people can see they can see um a value in it and also a it doesn't mean it has to be fixed price, but they can see that there's an end to it. I think if you're going to stick your prices up, people don't know where it's going to end. When's the kitchen going to be finished, for example? Then that's then you have got a problem. So it's about bring, and I imagine that's uh, one of the things you'll be talking about uh, this afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's so. That's such a good point, and I'm so glad you raised it. And um, and I think communicating to your clients what's included and what's not, and this does um, lead into how we can help those people that can't afford the higher prices um, but actually what we also need to so communicating to the clients is really important but what you really need to do is get it really clear in your head and I would say from this um, from this training everyone should spend some time writing and brainstorming some things down and the first thing I would say is what makes you stand out what makes you special like why should people pay more money to work with you than somebody else and I know for so many people it would be because I care, I go the extra mile, I will, you know, I will fight tooth and nail for this client. 
And actually you can use that in your marketing mm -hmm. and when you talk to people, but it's also getting it in your head. So, so you're justifying why you deserve to be paid a decent amount of money. And what I always ask people to do as well is work out their hourly rate. Now, I'm not saying we charge based on an hourly rate because we charge for results and the benefits we're going to provide people with. But actually, if we work out our hourly rate, sometimes it's a real, you know, shock when you're like, actually, in terms of my hourly rate, I'm not making much money at all. <laughs> um, and coaches are typical examples of this. People think, oh, gosh, you're, you're charging like 500 quid a month or six or 700 quid a month for a monthly client and you're only seeing them for like three hours a month but all the work you're doing behind the scenes and everything else that you're giving that client um add you know two things add that up in terms of results and benefits that the client is going to get but then also work out how much time you're spending work out your hourly rate and say actually am i happy earning 25 quid an hour because for some people it will be that um, mm. you know, for some people, I think we worked out it's about eight quid an hour. Yeah, some it's believe like, it. oh, come on, <laughs> what more proof do you need? You could go and work in Tesco's for that and not have any of this hassle and emotional involvement in running your own business. Um, so work out your hourly rate and say, actually, what am I worth? And have a, um, a figure that you will not drop below. So I, like, you know, say to yourself, statement it, write it down. I... Miss Hancock, um, hereby saying that I will not allow myself to charge less than the equivalent of fifty pounds an hour, for example, um, and and make sure that you implement it. You know, <laughs> write it down like a contract to yourself, um, because until we start valuing ourselves and our own worth and what our time and our um, and and it's not just our time. Remember, it's not just the time. You're not paying for time and um, time for money. We've just established that. Uh, but it's not just the effort you're putting in, it's all the training you've had, all the money you've spent on getting your qualifications, on keeping your skills updated. So, you know, I had a client say, oh, someone's just said that compared to a physiotherapist, what I'm charging per hour is outrageous. And I'm like, yes, but what else are they getting for that? And what else have you had to put in? Yes, physios have to put in a lot of work to get qualified, of course. I think physios are vastly underpaid, mm -hmm. by the way. But um, yeah, just, you know, you've got to do that, that working out so you can really justify to yourself and hold your head up high. And if anyone ever challenges you on your hourly rate, especially if it's a friend or family member, by the way, mm -hmm. even if you don't want to go back at them, which I'm not necessarily suggesting you do, um, but you can justify it in your own head. And then you can have this like protection of not allowing it to penetrate and make you, um, you know, fill your mind with doubt, with feelings of low self-worth and gosh, I'm charging too much, I need to lower my prices and actually just think, yeah, mm. I, I am worth this. I'm absolutely worth this. And you can throw a swear word in there as well to make it even more powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so apart from making it your screensaver on your computer, your statement of this is what I'm worth every hour, are there any other ways to help? Because it's just the psychology of it more than anything, isn't it? And and I know this is true because actually just recently there is um, – I was at a, a, a training and there's a, a very experienced coach there and she suddenly realized, she said, why is it I always assume my clients haven't got any money? And I said, I have had that problem. And once I decided to just do exactly what you said, up my price by 100 quid, basically, for, a, for an online session, I thought, well, didn't make any difference at all. And because uh, it was still within giving good value. In fact, it was I was undercharging before and I was told, oh, that sounds a bit cheap, you know, exactly what you said. And and, it, and I was amazed, actually, how easy it was <laughs> once I've done it and how effective it was. Yeah. But it, um, but what it is, we do tend to I think particularly women, we're so connected about worrying about the other person and making assumptions about their lack of money. Um, and yet you know, you'll talk to someone perhaps on Facebook who's going through a divorce and they're and they're very money conscious. And then you find they've already spent two grand on lawyers fees and got nowhere because they've been talking to the wrong the wrong lawyers, obviously, or not being clear. I didn't have a plan to help help the lawyers know what it is what they wanted to achieve. So it's it is amazing how we can easily sus make assumptions about our potential clients that are not even true. Yeah. 
and that usually starts because of what's in our own head about ourselves um mm. i'll come on to in a minute but like rich people get divorced as well mm. it's not just poor people that get divorced um you know you could say oh um and i have actually fallen victim to this mentality when my business wasn't going that well startup businesses don't have money to invest mm. like that sounds like quite a true statement but actually there are a lot of people that are setting up a business that perhaps have been made redundant and have had a redundancy um, payout or you know they, they've they've actually allocated a certain amount to set their business up mm. um they they maybe have a job so they can invest in setting up their business or maybe they are lucky enough to have savings or rich husbands but they are you know they're going to value you more if you're charging a rate i'm not saying charge loads just for the sake of it and just because we're all money grabbing money hungry people i don't believe we are and um, i think the coaching industry sometimes has got a bit ott like 10 grand yeah. for um a, a vip day or something yes their top pitters can, can absolutely command that but some people are just putting their prices up because they think if i put my price up people are going to think i'm really good um, and you will get found out if you do that. So, so, don't. so how how do you decide? How, if you, for those who are who are listening, who and, and watching, who have a a, a particular skill, they, they know they bring a very specific value to their clients, and are thinking that maybe their hourly rate is a little bit on the low side. Once they look at all the time they put into those clients, how what's a good way to start? What how do, how do you begin to work out what you should be charging? So I would do some benchmarking. Um, I used to work in HR and we used to spend hours on these really boring, dull salary surveys that would show the mean, the medium and the maximum and minimum and all these malarkey. Those are stats. And um, and when I first started looking at that, um, we were, you know, it was almost like, how little can I get away with paying our, our employees? Mm. Um, so we would go as low as we could, but still be able to say, well, according to the research, actually, you're not badly paid. So we would get away with it. And anyone that moaned would just say, tough. Um, and then I moved to the City of London for an investment bank. I did the same exercise. They wanted to pay more than anyone else was paying because mm. that was part of their attraction strategy because people obviously wanted the big bucks. Mm. Um, and it actually is quite similar for um, for, for companies, for in entrepreneurs, for mm. people that have got their own company. Mm. And it's a similar psychology. Um, people will think you're quality if you're charging more. So do some benchmarking, see what people in your local area and, and more widely are charging. Obviously yeah. in London, there's probably a premium, but why not be pay, charge London premiums for a, uh, for a london type quality service and but you're not in london so they don't have to go to london to get that service they've got yeah. it on the doorstep you know mm. you can turn most of these things around and make it into a selling point mm. um, i had a lady that um she was just a friend i was just informally coaching her who runs a local gym and um and she was worried that her prices were getting too high and it was, might be turning people off and i said well when i think of your gym i think of a london gym in little Chalfont, in the home counties. Now, actually, like, that's what I love about it. It's you yeah. are high-end. She's passionate about what she does. She's committed. She's always improving. So if she wasn't charging high prices, it doesn't mean say I wouldn't go, but I probably wouldn't, you know, it just matches. It, it does. It feels wrong, doesn't it? You, I mean, uh, I'm the same for me, although, like you, I, I like a good bargain at any time, but I do judge things by... The price, I mean, that's just, as you say, it's kind of embedded in our psychology. So we might as well just accept it and work with it. Yeah, totally. And, um, and, and part of, you know, charging, you've got, to be, you've got to be aware of your own money set point and your own money blocks. So if you have money blocks, you're going to find it really hard to raise your prices. And actually, I think everyone has money blocks. Yeah. Um, some are really gung-ho and could just blast through them. But we mentioned, especially women earlier, women tend to be um, find that harder. I'm not saying men, are, men don't, but a lot of men don't. Um, so think about what is your money set point? So for example, if you were looking at, I don't know, um, staying at a hotel, say, um, where would you 
be comfortable spending the money? Would it be around the £120 a night mark? Or um, actually, would you be really happy to spend 500 quid a night because you want that VIP service and that luxury? Or would you be happy spending 50 quid a night or 60? Um, or would that horrify you? Mm. And just notice how you feel about those different bands. And if you're like, oh, no, yeah, I would stay in that cheap hotel because I just don't want to spend my money, then you've got a money block um, and you need to shift that money set point. Um, so I'm not saying you have to go out and spend loads of money on hotels, just be aware of it and then know that you might have to, you know, it might be something as simple as you always buy value brands, but actually I'm going to, I'm going to buy the, the Tesco finest or the, you know, the luxury version just so I can get a bit used to, because this isn't going to break the bank, just so I can get mm. a bit used to spending more money and, and paying for quality. And just yeah. and slowly start re-educating your mind. Um, and, you know, little things like that help. But I would say, and I'm going to give a plug here, but um, my Money Mindset a Mentoring Programme, which just kicked off, but we've only had the intro call so far, is perfect for someone that knows they're going to really struggle with raising their prices. Um, and we've probably got some, sorry, I haven't been looking at seeing who's on. But I know, um, so Bonnie's in the um, in the program. I've got some comments. Um, oh, here they are. Um, Bonnie, maybe you could just write a couple of lines down about um, what the Money Mindset program has done for you. And um, and it is just it, it's just spending that concentrated time on mm. getting the mind stuff worked out of understanding why you're programmed to feel that you don't deserve to earn enough money. Um, that maybe you you don't you have low self-esteem and that's impacting your money mindset and therefore what you're charging and um, that's that really make- really interesting idea that you're looking at your own behavior and whether you're always go for the the because I, I i i i'll justify because i go i want airbnb because it's more of an experience but it is a cost as well and it is i think again for a lot of particularly mums we, we are very bad at treating ourselves and just it, we have we are absolutely aware that I have massive blocks around that, and and the fact, but the fact that that translates into how you then what you charge for your business it isn't a link that most people would make. So I think that's a really interesting idea, and does explain a lot of why particularly women do seem to have these this uncomfortable uncomfortableness. What would be really useful because I do hear this a lot from mediators, and of course many mediators are, are often women. Um, and they constantly telling me, oh, my clients, they can't, they won't afford this. They won't pay for that. There's all they're worried about is the money. And I can see that, that they clearly have blocks there, but how, but that it's very embedded and in that, that belief. And I'm thinking, how can all of their clients not be prepared to spend a few extra few hundred quid when their legal costs will be are so much higher mm-hmm. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense to me. So, if you have you got any guidance, for, particularly for mediators who are stuck in that mindset of I can't charge more to the kind of the kind of clients that I have at the moment, which are um, which will be varied, and and um, and perhaps talk a bit about a their block and b for those who really are actually quite skint, what what can be done. Uh, yeah. for them so we're yeah, not ignoring yeah. them because as you know we we want to look after everybody yeah absolutely so several things so um if i miss answering a part of that question Susan, um sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> stay on it so um first of all i think it's um are you actually attracting those clients and those clients only and is that because of your marketing and yes, let's leave aside for a moment the fact that you might be pas- really passionate about reaching and helping those people, because I'm going to talk about how we can do that. But actually, to in order to help those people more, you need income so that you can get yourself to a position where it's easier to help those people. Yeah. Um, so you need to get some higher end clients. So does that mean marketing in a different um, a different space to different people? It, it all comes down to who is your ideal client and actually are you limiting yourself by saying my ideal client is someone who can't afford it like that's a really rubbish ideal client sorry to be blunt and mean but it is because that's not a great business model um so okay i'm still passionate about serving those people because we're lovely people and we like to help people especially those less fortunate than us 
but actually in order to do that how can I actually go out and get some other clients that can actually afford to pay me so it might be as simple as that mm-hmm. um, the other thing is actually do you know that they can't afford you or are they just not valuing you and I think this is the big one yeah so for what you do um, I would say you need to write it down all the different elements of what you do and the not just the process like we meet up and we I can talk to you and your husband and we go into different rooms and blah 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 and we reach agreement what are the results and the benefits that that provides you reach agreement what does that mean you reach an agreement that both people are happy with and can you know just keep extending it and can leave being um, not necessarily the best of friends but being you know respectful and brought into each other's challenges struggles you know outcomes um supportive of each other um you know you haven't had to go and drag it through the lawyers who will just go backwards and forwards backwards and forwards and charge you however many hundreds of pounds for a letter um let alone anything else and um you know how much potentially are you saving them in getting lots of thumbs up thank you thank you um how much are you saving them in terms of money that lawyers might charge? And you're not here to totally diss lawyers, but actually... Well, it's the cold court, going to court process involves lawyers possibly... But it, 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 it's usually... I've been quoted by a couple of lawyers who say, the minute you start going to court, you're talking a minimum £25,000, £30,000. So yeah. it's, it's a lot of money. And, and I, I often feel that a lot of mediators don't convey how much they can save their clients and then translate that as to yeah and I can agree with you I think they just haven't conveyed that message very clearly um because you might not have much money now but you're gonna have a lot less if you have to go to if it all gets out of hand it becomes a mess yeah so you've got if you've got that actual like working with me is going to cost you this much but working with a lawyer could cost you this much and a minimum it's going to cost you this much it becomes a no-brainer it's almost like you don't need to do anything else Mm. but also extend that and say okay what are the benefits what are the benefits to each party and especially um relating to which party you're you're representing but also the family you know children obviously they pull on our heartstrings more than anyone else Mm. if i can avoid going to court or you know through the lawyers or whatever and I don't have to drag the children through it, and we can actually reach a um, a nice outcome financially for the children and in terms of access and all the rest, then how can you not do that? I know some people still won't do it. Some people will never do it. They want to go the whole hog. They but they want the fight. But yeah. can, uh, do you think it helps as well when people pack it the way they package things? So for a good example of this is um, mediators will be concerned that, yes, you still need some lawyer time, but it's just much less if you're using mediation. Um, you might need time with a financial planner, working with a divorce coach would be great. But they their immediate reaction is, oh, people won't spend all that money up front, even, even though ultimately the benefits will far outweigh that the, any, any initial cost because they don't um i guess a lot of them don't yet collaborate enough to be able to package that and and send and do you think packaging what you sell as well is is another way to communicate the benefits and to make it easier for you to charge more at comfortably because you're really um you're offering not just your services but the other perhaps other uh, collaborations that you've brought into the mix. Absolutely. So I think collaboration is really, really important. And actually having, so this leads into how you can help those people that haven't got as much money. Having like, um, I mean, the typical thing, bronze, silver and gold service, maybe even a platinum VIP one. um, I would try and stick with three if possible. Don't overcomplicate it because else an overcomplicated mind is an overwhelmed mind that never makes decisions. Um, and we'll just walk out the door and go somewhere else where it's more, much simpler and probably more expensive too. Um, so, um, so what, like, what can you add into, or, or sometimes actually work backwards, what can you take away from the more basic level that actually is a nice to have, but what, what does that person need absolutely essentially for the minimum level of service that they would require in order to 
get the job done. Um, okay, and then what's what can you charge for that? And then you make the other packages really, really um, uh, attractive. Um, and there, there's also a trick that some people recommend, have a low end and make your mid, mid range one closer to the high end so it's less of a leap to go to the high end. Um, so people are, you know, if they're really stuck for cash, they're gonna go for the low option anyway, but if they're in the middle, it's not too much of a jump to go to the gold standard. Mm. Um, and this is just like, it, it's just, but, well, you could say it's selling psychology, buying psychology, but it's it's service. It's like ha actually, again, valuing your time, valuing what you're bringing. What else can you add to those services? And um, And if you're worried about sort of not serving the lower people enough, what can you give them that doesn't cost you any money? You know, what resources are, could you put some of your resources online and deliver them that way rather than in person? Um, could they work with one of your associates um, and, you know, rather than you who is the owner of the practice and the most qualified? How can you make it differentiated but still make it accessible and valuable for those people that can't afford it but still give the gold standard service? You know, you see this, I always say, you pay yourself to um, a hairdresser because you see it, like trainee or um, somebody's doing it for free, um, you know, associate or whatever they're called, and like head stylist person. There's massive jumps in, in what yeah. people charge. And actually people will happily charge a lot of money, uh, pay a lot of money to get a haircut. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just, you know, I have pointed that out to clients before with deep yeah. respect for them. But, you know, they're, they're paying for their hair, but they won't value the future of their relationship or business or whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, I think there is a, it, it's not necessarily just saying that to the client, because that could obviously come across as a bit um, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but it's also having it in your head. Saying, actually, going back to my hourly rate, I'm worth more than a hairdresser. So um, having that belief and carrying that through as well, um, does that does that make sense? Yeah, and well, of course, a hairdresser gets repeat business. So I think, again, people have to look at how many times, you know, if I, am I going to help this person so that actually they don't need me anymore? Then you need to charge more because you're not you have, you're not looking for an ongoing client. So again, it needs to be looked at that way. But uh, no, they're very useful. Well, any spe other specific ways of serving the broader uh I say the broader market, the people that who have really genuinely would struggle or don't or to be blunt, maybe don't value what you do enough to pay the money up front. Because this is something I've discovered. So what I the way I've got around it, just to hear your, your views on this, is I, I say to people if they want a divorce strategy session, there is a charge. I mean, in my case, I'm not recommending this to, to everyone else. Uh, I do say uh, it's 100 percent refundable at the end, which it is. Um, if they don't need anything else and they're happy, they've got what they want, off they go. And that's great. Invariably, that's not the case. Otherwise, it wouldn't work very well as, as a model. But it, it just means that nobody's kind of kept away. However, I'm very clear before I do those step sessions, there is a cost. They've got to put the money in. And if they're not quite ready to really move forwards, if they're just still in, to be blunt, victim mode, and it's all just, ah, and, and, they, and they don't really... They, they want rescuing rather than to support to move forwards. I've got lots of free stuff for them. Yeah, There's yeah. loads of free. And I've created all this content. So I, I feel okay about going. <laughs> it's still loads of good stuff. And you can keep using all of that as much as you like. But if you really want to move forwards at any speed and get some support, here I am. But this is how it works. And for me, that really, really helped me get over that lump bump of, of, of just not giving everything away for free all the time, which was uh, definitely something I know a lot of people have made the mistake of in the past. Absolutely. So I love what you've done there because you're valuing your own time mm -hmm. and also they're coming in with more skin in the game. So they, yes. you're going to get rid of some of the time wasters. Totally. Like say, yeah. The things that aren't ready to, yeah. to take that step. So mm -hmm. I think having something a similar way, like having access to like a checklist or a, that could be called are you ready for mediation or are you ready for a divorce strategy session and mm. it could be as simple as that and like you know just some questions that is going to make yeah. them decide 
yes, I should do this, or yes, actually, no, I'm going to go and um, really think about this first, or you know, do that, that, and that. So like those kinds of things. Um, and by the way, guys, I'm going to check in a second if there's any questions. There are any questions um, that you um, that you want to post, and I really do appreciate the comments and, and thumbs up and so on. Um, any questions, just just let me know. Um, I haven't been putting those on the screen, the comments, because they hide our faces if I do. Um, <laughs> really great to that we we disappear under the... <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, come up with a strategy. You know, I know, um, so I, I think I've shared this before, but um, I was kind of heading towards the divorce courts at one, at one point, and um, I spoke to a close friend who had been through it. She said she went to a free... Um, they were doing like open sessions that was um, taking place at a hotel and they had a meeting room there and you went for your free half hour session and got more information if you wanted to carry on great really great way of getting clients mm -hmm. however um that involved me traveling so it was a big hassle or it would have involved me traveling um i would have much rather and i probably would have been more inclined to do it um had i been ready for that if it had been an online meeting, but they could have run out of their office. You know, mm -hmm. why put extra steps in the way, make it as easy as possible, but also be mindful that it's a balance that you don't want the time wasted. So don't make it too easy. And actually, I would have been very happy, had I have gone for it, to, um, to pay some money. Um, you know, it would have given me more skin in the game. And, um, and you know, I think, I think what you've done, Susie, there is, is really good. Like, this is a refundable amount if you're not happy or if it doesn't give you value. You might get someone who says, sorry, that was rubbish, when you really know it, it, it wasn't. It was actually really oh, it's more that It's more that they've, um, it, it is that they've, they are happy to DIY it from there and they're like, thank you very much. And they don't need any of my time, more of my time. Yeah. So that, and then, and then that's fine. So I think, and I think this is important to, but for a lot of people with helping them with this jumping into charging a bit more for what they do and valuing what they do is 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 it goes back to what you said work out the value of your time so if i can send somebody something that's free then that's fine but if i'm they're going to use up my hours there is only one of me and and what i'm always thinking is how scalable is this yes um, there is no point in me building a fantastic business that if i'm ill or go on holiday it stops that's crazy. I've got I've got to be able to think yeah, of the bigger yeah. picture. And I think that helped me as well as like looking beyond myself and how I value my own time to this is my business. What am I growing here? How many more people can I help? And that, again, psychologically, I think, helped me get over that leap um, quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And and Susie, you're doing a um, like a, a weekend workshop, aren't you? So, again, yes, getting people there. They're, they're invested, although I know you're doing it for free, but they're giving up their time. So they're only going to go if they're serious and they're there. And um, and you are doing one to many rather than one to one, yeah. which is fabulous. Um, and I do think you can charge for it, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's and so tell everyone in case anyone knows of anyone that needs to go on this um this weekend. well they do they the um they, they do people do pay but it's a very low amount to okay. who are coming as attendees the professionals the businesses who share their skills the workshops i'm not charging them which might seem odd but i'm but i but there is a charge in the sense i want need their collaboration i need them to share so and again that's perhaps another thing is perhaps not always looking at it as money so i've found i've created quite a lot of collaborations with professionals who don't like get spending money <laughs> don't don't value marketing perhaps as much as they they should but that's okay i've given them things that are very useful for them and their clients to share which also helps me help help more people so that there's often ways of doing these things that isn't always just about that the amount that you charge though that is important for your time but there's creative ways that you can get value help other people provide you with with value yeah. um, for the time that you're putting in and the effort that you're putting in yeah. yeah so if anyone's doing those open um open walking sessions could you run them as a group? Could you do them over the phone? Could you have people booked in so you're not sitting in a hotel room or hiring a hotel room when you don't need to? You know, there's there's various ways you can do it to utilise your time and your, you know, 
reduce your outgoing so you can therefore raise your profits. But, um, you know, and don't be afraid to charge for those sessions. You can make it refundable. If people are serious about getting the advice, they're going to pay for it. They'll be happy to pay for it. Um, and if they're not, then provide them with something for free. So, um, yeah, I think that's... Um, it. I'm just going to check for any questions. And Susie, if you've got any more, let me know. Just, I'm going just to... So that's a good, good point you just made there about um, charging for um, a deposit for a, a session because they're much more likely to turn up because if they lose the deposit or um, if they don't turn up, but it's guaranteed that they can have it back. Um, yeah, yeah. Also, it makes the next step easier that if they then, then go, oh, I do want these services, they've already put money in the game. And that, I, th I find that works really, works really well for me as a customer. I've, I've had that done to me and I yeah. thought this has worked brilliantly. I think I should start doing this myself. So I think that's a really good idea that you can, sometimes you can charge, but it's completely refundable at the end but they're going to turn up because as we all know, free events, yeah, you're lucky to get 25% of the people to turn up who, who say they are. One of my clients does um, a free 15 minute consultation, which is literally bang, bang, bang. This is what, I, you know, what are your problems? Okay. Mm -hmm. I know I can help you. Let's book a consultation which you might, which you do pay for. It's like an hour or ninety minutes or whatever. Yeah. Um, which you do pay for, and you might. And I will basically, she's saying to them, she's being quite honest and open. I will pitch to you the program that I think would be good for you then. But if you don't want it, that's fine because that consultation on its own is worth so much. Yeah. So they're coming in. They've been pre-qualified. They've paid the money. So if they want to carry on, then as you say, they've already put their hand in their pocket. So that's an easier. It's less of a leap for them to do that. Um, and for that 90 minutes she's giving, which she used to give for free, um, she's getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. So if they step into a programme, fabulous, what a brilliant use of her time, and she's been paid for it. And if they don't, she's still been paid for her time. Um, so it, it works really, really well for her, actually. I actually put a good, another really good point in there because the, it's not about just what do I charge, what's my hourly rate, it's how do you structure your whole sales process? And and unless you look at it as a whole, what journey are you taking your clients on? Then you're not you're not going to you're not going to struggle to set what the price is. So it's looking at it in that context. I think that's a really really good point. Absolutely. And um, so kind of coming full circle, Susie, in terms of your first question, what if I? This is what the worry of a lot of people, a lot of you guys will have. What if I lose clients by raising my prices? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we've done enough to convince you that that's probably not going to happen. And actually, the ones that you might lose, you really don't want anyway, and you want the higher that, income. That's what I found, definitely, yes. Yeah. There is another way, and you can work this out if you're very good with numbers and with recording how many, um, how much you get for each session, and I think which actually mm. we could all know. Um, but when I was working with, um, with people in the healthcare industry and trying to put their price up for physios and podiatrists and so on. And um, we, we worked it out. And most of them, if they did a, just a 10% rise in prices, which basically isn't much, mm. um, they could afford to lose 10% of their client base. And actually, when most of them were struggling and time poor in terms of they just couldn't fit enough clients into the hours that they had, mm. it was great that they did lose some clients because they were earning the same, worst case scenario, they were earning the same amount of money for seeing less clients, so they had more time. So they could give mm. those clients a better service, they could um, upsell them into other things, and it was the serious people with the serious problems that were coming to them, which was the work they enjoyed, and the time wasters and you know, the like ingrown toenails and stuff that they weren't really that bothered about doing, those people would go elsewhere to someone that, that was cheaper. Um, so it was all it's a win on all levels. Um, and we literally worked that out in terms of the figures. And that that was a bit, it won't be the same for everyone, because that was obviously they had a lot of clients coming in. But if you can work that out, um, that will be really reassuring in terms of, OK, I can put my prices up and I can afford to lose those people. That might be great news to you. Um, but what I'd love to know, and um, I think sort of wrapping things up, Susie, is a commitment from you guys. I don't know if you're brave enough to comment, but um, say, yeah, I'm going to put my prices up. Um, Go on, do it. 
<laughs> but I'm just going to quickly post the comments here to show that we have we have got some bad comments here. Even um, if it's ten percent, you know, it is just just to to get over the hump and and go. Oh, actually, that's fine. And and it's you, you can, like you said earlier, you can do it gently, but it is making that commitment. Joanne, I love that comment. This works for me. Looking for clients that can pay, so I can help those that can't. Yay. Yeah, that's a really good philosophy. And also the clients that you end up with are they really value you and they're so much they're lovely to work with. And it's very hard helping people who are oh kind of on the fence about how the it's just it's a nightmare and it's better that they just <laughs> go somewhere else and you just stick with the people who who really get how much you're helping them and everybody's happier uh, ultimately. And I think, see, like one as one person or one company, we can't save the world. But actually, if we can have a bigger impact on the people we do work with, then that's only a good thing. And there's always going to be people coming through that are charging those lower mm -hmm. prices. So make yourself the gold standard service. Make yourself that gold standard provider, service provider, med, uh, mediator, whatever. And um, and and because who doesn't want to feel like they're they're giving a first class service and that they are the gold standard. Um, it will raise you in terms of your confidence and your, your self worth and your self value. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a nice thing. I can't you know. see your eyes anymore. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they put uh, Facebook Live with Big B Live stuck the uh, comment right across your face. Sorry, I've my screen. <laughs> So, uh, nice to see those comments, though, and and uh, perhaps that's a later webinar um, on for those who do want to really expand. But I think it, you've made such a good point. It's so important not to just well, I'm going to do one to the many, and I'm just going to go for it before you've actually honed down what it is you offer and really got up close and personal with your clients, made sure you're giving them exactly what they need, making a fantastic service, and then look at how you can expand the, the reach, either of that service or other aspects of what you can do to, yeah. a, to a broader audience. But you can't miss that step out. Mm, absolutely. And so often people try to. And yeah. It no. <laughs> Definitely not. Fantastic. So um, wrapping up, we are back next month. We will let you know the date and the title. Um, but we, um, we are really open to what you guys need. So if you can um, message us or post on the Facebook um, or wherever you see this video, write a comment, tell us what it is that you would like and need in terms of advice and coaching. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and we can make sure we provide that for you. That's what we're here to do. Thank you very much, Liz. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.